Hey, happy Friday. This week, Humane launched an AI pin that looks like kind of a disaster. Sony launched a new image sensor that looks amazing. And Risk v became involved in the chip wars. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. This video was sponsored by Brilliant. First up, new CounterPoint data says that the iPhone 15 Pro Max costs Apple $37.7 more to make than its predecessor did at launch. What got cheaper this year around was the display at $4 and the memory by $16 even with the new model launching with 2 more gigabytes of RAM. But the more expensive stuff includes the new A17 chip at $30 more because of that 3 nanometer process being more expensive. The camera system is more expensive with the 5X telephoto system and OIS adding $25, while the titanium used in the device added another $7 extra over last year's steel. Overall, these are pretty expensive changes. And then next, MediaTek this week launched the Dimensity 9300, their flagship chip for Android phones, with all the usual improvements around the GPU, the AI engine, etc., but with the biggest news being around its unusual CPU structure. They called their layout the All Big Core Design, with four Ultra Cores and four Big Cores. The four Ultra Cores are Cortex-X4 CPU cores running at various clock speeds, and the four Big Cores are the A720s, and all of this means that the CPU has no efficiency cores at all. That is really unusual because basically almost every other smartphone chip only has one kind of ultra core at the high end and we always thought that efficiency cores are particularly important on phones because you know you have a tiny battery so you really want to have something efficient. But MediaTek says that it is both better and more efficient overall to turn on a more powerful core to run a job quickly and then to power that core down versus using a lower power core for much longer. And this year, Qualcomm kind of seems to agree with them too. The new Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 also only has two efficiency cores this year, down from four last year, and their Snapdragon Elite X computer chips have no efficiency cores at all. That is three different chips from two different manufacturers completely deprioritizing efficiency cores, which can't really be a coincidence in my opinion. Of course, we haven't seen any real devices with these chips yet, so we'll just have to wait and see whether they are right. Next up, a report from Windows Central said that Microsoft will bring Copilot to Windows 10 and not just leave it for Windows 11 and presumably Windows 12. Windows 10 is still active on a billion devices per month, so I guess they didn't want to leave all of that behind. And while there's no word exactly in the report on when this will happen, my best guess is that maybe in a couple of months. Talking of AI, Samsung this week unveiled its generative AI model called Gauss, which consists of Gauss language, Gauss code, and Gauss image, representing three different capabilities. We'll have to wait to see how they perform, I guess, in the Galaxy S24 series, but one interesting feature that they have already teased is AI live translations for phone calls in real time. Kinda wild. And since every company needs its own AI now, Amazon is now developing its own large language model as well, codenamed Olympus, which is expected to power new features for their online store, for Alexa and AWS, maybe by December. And interestingly, with a reported 2 trillion parameters for training, this could make it one of the largest models ever being trained, as it would be twice that of GPT-4. I guess somebody had a few too many AWS credits lying around and decided to just train an AI. Okay, and for my first story of the week, we have to talk about Humane's new AI pin, and man oh man do I think this is going to get ugly. So the company has finally launched its much-hyped AI pin, which is basically a mid-range Android phone just without a screen pinned to your clothes. You talk to it with your voice, it runs a custom chat GPT-based assistant, and it has a camera and a tiny laser projector on the front. And everything they have shown us so far looks pretty rough in my opinion. So the Humane AI pin has a constant T-Mobile connection, at least in the US, because they actively say that you should use this instead of, rather than together with your phone. It has these magnetic battery accessories that you can swap out so you never have to take the thing off. And it also has a light that blinks when your cameras are in use. And in case you're wondering, the photos that they've shown us so far were taken in very much not challenging lighting scenarios, and they still managed to look like something that came out of a three-year-old budget phone, with obviously blown out highlights clearly visible noise even in bright scenes, and weirdly smooth skin and other textures. Anyway, so what are you supposed to do with this device? Well, you're supposed to talk to it, kind of like an advanced version of Siri or Google Assistant. 
The demos that they've shown included multiple mistakes, including them asking how much protein is in a bunch of almonds that they held up, to which the AI incorrectly answered 15 grams, when apparently the internet agrees that it's more like six. They included asking the AI where they should go to watch an eclipse, to which the AI replied with data from a previous eclipse that already happened, and so on. So, you know, classic AI hallucination stuff. Also, as far as we know, this is literally just running a version of ChatGPT, which means that everything that you can do on this device, you very likely can do exactly as well, or maybe even better on any device you already have that can run the ChatGPT app. So, ugh. I think the original concept was that the camera and the microphone would always be on, so you'd have the kind of automatic memory features and you would have context of what you did, but I guess that didn't work out for privacy or for battery life reasons, and now this is just the kind of chat GPT machine. And to rub some salt into these wounds, the AI pin costs $699 and $24 a month on top, which I guess at least includes the T-Mobile connection. That is insanely expensive for something that you can already do with an app on your phone. The company raised an insane $230 million and has over 100 employees, as far as I can tell. So this is a huge operation, and that's because it's run by former Apple employees who basically tried to sell all of this as the next big device form factor. Now, I do believe that eventually some kind of a wearable device with cameras and microphones and AI built in is going to become a big deal. And I also think that the Meta Ray-Ban glasses, for example, actually look pretty promising. But this humane AI pin just seems completely wrong somehow. Okay, and now moving on to more positive news, Sony actually announced a really impressive new image sensor that I think will significantly change photography and potentially come even to smartphones pretty soon. So camera sensors until now in almost all cameras, both the large ones and smartphones, actually capture an image line by line. So each line of pixels is captured with a tiny delay and then those get combined into a final image. This is called a rolling shutter. Of course, this means that there's an actual delay between the various parts of the image, which creates all sorts of distortions, especially with fast moving subjects. But Sony's new image sensor is the first one on a camera that kind of normal mortals can buy that can have the full sensor read out all at the same time. This is called a global shutter, and it means that the time distortion is just gone. Poof. The sensor launched in the new and still pretty expensive Alpha 9 Mark III, but it should now start to make its way into cheaper and cheaper cameras and smartphones eventually too. And this being an incredibly fast image sensor means that we can do some pretty crazy things with it. First, there's no need for a physical shutter. You know, the thing that actually goes like this, opens and closes in front of the sensor in the big cameras. All of that can be gone, that saves money, space. It's a moving object that we don't have to build in that might not break in the future. Second, there's no rolling shutter in both videos and photos. So this kind of distorted jello effect is just gone. And third, the sensor can take a very fast photos and videos. This means ultra fast shutter speeds at one eighty thousandths of a second that really help to freeze a frame. It means the ability to sync external flashlights much more accurately to any photo. And my favorite thing, which is composite raw. This takes a ton of photos in a really short burst and then combines them into a single raw file that is significantly cleaner than it would be otherwise. Now, this last thing, the compositing of images is something that, especially on phones, we've been doing for a while because smartphones just have insane amounts of computing power made especially for this. But now with this really, really fast image sensor, we can do that with even bigger cameras and even faster, etc. Really exciting. Okay, and for my third story of the week, now RISC-V is getting dragged into the chip wars. So if you didn't know, RISC-V is the new-ish open and free instruction set architecture for CPUs. This means that anyone can make a CPU built on RISC-V technologies, unlike ARM or x86, where one always needs a license. Sounds good. What could go wrong? Well, turns out some people don't want just everyone to be able to build new chips. Specifically, a bipartisan group of US politicians is petitioning the White House to restrict transfer of know-how around RISC-V to China. Now, Chinese firms like Alibaba have been particularly keen on launching RISC-V chips because it promises them independence, but now the 18 US lawmakers want to block RISC-V tech that is, quote, aiding the technological goals and the geopolitical interests of the People's Republic of China. Now, RISC-V was developed primarily in the University of Berkeley in the US with government funding, so there's that, but it's also open source and China already has every access to it that it could, so I guess there's very little that they can actually prohibit them to 
have right now. Specifically, the lawmakers want to stop extra additional IP developed by US companies like sci five from reaching China, which seems wildly inefficient. Trying to stop a fundamentally open technology from propagating across borders seems just completely futile. I think the US government would be much better off if they just focused on trying to make sure that their risk 5 chip makers were actually doing better than the Chinese ones. Now, if building better technologies, whether it is chips or software or anything else, is something that you would like to do yourself, then you will need skills around engineering and science, and the best place to learn those is over at Brilliant. Brilliant is an online platform that is purpose-built for teaching you science, computer science, engineering, and other STEM skills in a really great way. They just dropped excellent new courses called Thinking in Code, which teaches you the logic of a software developer, and another new one called How Large Language Models Work, which is particularly exciting, especially given and all the AI news. Brilliant's special sauce is that they design really high quality courses for each topic with interactivity in mind. So they take complicated sciencey topics, they break each of those down into many smaller chunks, they arrange those so that you can progress from beginner levels to advanced ones in little sprints, and then they make you practice what you've learned in each course with a practice exercise at the end. It is an incredibly effective and fun system that helps you retain knowledge a lot better than just passively reading a book or watching a video. Brilliant has thousands of lessons covering a ton of STEM topics, and new lessons get added every month, so whatever STEM skill it is that you want to get better at, they probably have you covered. You can get a 30-day free trial at brilliant.org TFC, and the first 200 people who sign up using that link will also get 20% off their annual premium subscription if they choose to get one. So check them out, happy learning, and I'll see you next Friday.